Welcome to Health Oddity, the show that strips away the jargon and hype surrounding all things health and fitness to help you live a long, strong and energetic life. Lining up at the bar this week, here's Peter Lant, Paul Bassett and James St. Pierre. Hello and welcome to the Health Oddity podcast, episode 48. We are closing in on our uh, on our one year birthday, and we're closing in on episode fifty. And we've got some real cracking guests uh, lined up over the next few weeks. And we are joined. We have a returning guest uh, with us today, who I will introduce you to uh, very soon to give us his uh, the stuff he's working on at the moment and uh, the kind of latest focus for him. But first of all, if I can just say hello to the usual uh, co-hosts uh, and the Health Oddity. Uh, team. Uh, hello, Mr. Peter Lance. Hello, how are we doing? I've decided I'm going to change my name to Uncle Peter because of my hair, like Vic Reeves. Remember him? Yeah, uh, legend. Uncle you know, Peter would come on with that. I'm trying, I'm basically, I'm, st- I'm, I'm basing my look, my new look on him. Okay. Well, I learned... Maybe Doc Emmett Brown from Back to the Future. Uh, it's not grey yet, but I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, hello, Mr. Paul Bassett. Hello. I, I, actually, that's I, I had most of my parental kind of um, coaching from him because uh, apparently you can't give baby booze. <laughs> <laughs> you can't give booze to baby. Yes. There we go. And, uh, and the guest that we have back uh, was first with us on way back on episode 12, which I think was around, I think Pete said it was around November last year. Uh, that we first uh, met this guy, and uh, he's someone that I've known for a long time, Mr. James Brees. Say hello, James. Hey guys, how are you doing? Good to be back. I can't believe episode 40. It feels like yesterday you guys started this thing and everything. It's awesome. It doesn't. (laughs) (laughs) It really has flown by. And just for those of you, first of all, I'd recommend if you haven't listened to episode 12, I know it was a while ago, but I would recommend you going back and listening to episode 12 uh, with James, uh, the first one he did. It was called Health Before Fitness, and you'll find it, uh, you know, just by scrolling back on whatever platform you're on. But we're going to kind of reference some of the things that he spoke about in his first episode, and we're going to move on uh, from there. But I've known James for probably, it's got to be at least 10 years, I think, probably more than that. Uh, James runs uh, Strength Matters. Um, He has I've had a number of, of snowboarding holidays with James. Um, he's a fantastic guy. He's incredibly knowledgeable. Um, and I think it was down to strength matters that the three of us, uh, Pete, Paul, and myself, first uh, first met. I think. Uh, yeah. Classic kettlebell fever T-shirt on for you guys today, especially uh, back in the day. Back in the kettlebell hey. fever days. Yeah, where we got- first. I've got two kettlebell fever kettlebells in my living room just sitting down there. I've the got minute. loads of kettlebell fever kettlebells and they t-shirts. Were, <laughs> yeah. they were bloody good. I, I wish I wish I'd have kept kettlebell fever up running, literally with the kettlebells over the pandemic. We'd have sold out like ridiculous yeah. amounts. I was gutted when you stopped doing them. I was like, where am I gonna get them from now? Because they were they were like the best ones. Oh, it's, no, it's, it's, like, it's honestly it. so many people have said that over the years now. And it's funny because the only reason we stopped was because, well, two reasons. One, my dad was like getting really pissed off and having to lug all the kettlebells from eight kilos up to 92 kilo kettlebells all the time. And the second thing was all the other kettlebell companies cottoned on, so we couldn't compete with, with them. And yet it's a genuine reason was they, like Wolverson and like some other guys, they just, they halved their kettlebell prices. So people are going, well, I can get the same kind of kettlebell for half the price. Even, and people just didn't see the value of it. So it was a race to the bottom. We were like, nah, let's focus on content and stuff. So that's why we stopped. But the number of people do ask, and even today, I wish I still had some of them left over. I've got 132 kilo in my back garden. That's it. <laughs> I've still got all of mine. And also we had, uh, don't worry, because it might we might get this sorted because we had Chris Denning on, a guy called Chris Denning the other week. And if he ruled the world, his first, his first thing would be to get rid of plastic kettlebells. Um, so he's, he's he's there. He's there. He's gonna he's gonna make it happen. Cool. So um, so the first time we spoke, um, James was talking to us about the thing the thing with strength matters and the thing with uh, with James's company. And I mean, I've 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 I think I've got every single magazine uh, ever produced going right back to the kettlebell fever days. And I've got I've still got all the ones now. Um, and I've got his book and everything else. So he focuses on oh, he's got a whole wodge of magazines. Go yeah. On. Um, <laughs> 
and he really focuses on on uh, what the term that, that James used is the everyday athlete. So it's everyday people, um, and I think over thirty is the kind of the main kind of uh, uh, kind of target demographic, if you like. But what we were talking about last time was this principle of seven seven seven, and it's something that um, many of my members have spoke to me about a lot which was the idea that before you start doing anything else, before you really start trying to dig into the minutiae and get granular with the detail, you need to be in the, doing some of the basics right. And we spoke about, uh, you know, aiming for, for a minimum of seven hours sleep per night, uh, seven glasses of water per day, and walking 7,000 steps per day. And that was, that was such a great, uh, really simple... Uh, kind of message because I know that people you know I, I can remember it, anyone can remember it and it gives people a really good place to start um, but what I think we'll do today uh, James is kind of find out a little bit more about what I mean this was obviously back in November and I know you're constantly evolving and constantly moving forward with things um, what's going on with strength matters at the moment and what's your what's your kind of focus with the content you're putting out and the coaching that you're doing uh, with, with your members at the moment yeah, that's, that's a really good question because it, it is always evolving. But you're right, the message we're tr really trying to focus on and just make it known for people is that we're helping people over 30 and not elite athletes, not you know super advanced things or anything at all, just everyday people, everyday athletes over 30. And most of the time, they're coming into fitness for the very first time. They're having like a mid, not a midlife crisis, but you know what I mean? Like a wake up call in their, in their mid 30s going, oh shit. I need to do something about this because I'm getting older and I want to live around and enjoy the, the, the best times of my life that are yet to come. And it's aiming for those things. And the more I write for the magazine, Fit Over 30, the more I'm learning about things, the more I realize there's, there's nothing out there in the fitness world that just caters for the complete beginner and showing them how to take the first step to the middle steps, not to advanced, just to middle steps and advanced. Whereas a lot of stuff out there from powerlifting to, they're all talking about the complex, the super elite stuff. Well, that's for the less than 1% of people. Like it's the main basic principles, the fundamentals of fitness, which not many people have. And like, it's not just strength training, it's cardio training. I, I guarantee you now, cardio is the biggest misunderstood concept out there, but it links to nutrition as well. Like everyone wants to skip the basics. Like, you know, WWS, prime example, that is the basics and fundamentals of human life. If you haven't got that, our philosophy is you haven't got much hope because you can't stick to some the real simplicities of human life. So why make things more complex? It's the same with anything else. So the more I write, um, I'll give an example. I just finished an article this morning uh, for next month's magazine, which is an Ironman magazine. It's all about triathlons and how to take somebody from the very first step of doing an Ironman or a triathlon. And it's like, well, most people who are now signing up for these big triathlons, these Olympic sprints, or even Ironmen, have never done a triathlon before. <laughs> and it's like, it's all, hang on a second, have you ever swum before in the sea? Have you ever um, done swimming? Like, can you swim? I think that's, that's the thing I see a lot of, somebody came to us the other week and said, hey, can we, I'm do a triathlon. Okay, great. So how many, how often, you, I've never swum before. Okay, you don't need a triathlon plan. You need to go find a swimming coach and learn how to swim in case you drown. That is your biggest life skill we can teach you right now, I think. So it's, it's going back to that and realizing that no matter what we do, the more complex things are, it's about catering to make it as simple and as non-confusing as possible because the world of health and fitness is so confusing right now. No matter what you do, and it's, it's making it simple, the basics, the fundamentals. Like with any sports, um, I'm doing a lot of cricket coaching, as in being coached myself from cricket, playing a lot of cricket. My coach is 72 years old. He's been there, he's been at the highest levels, right? But he takes me back to the fundamentals. Look at ball, hit ball, <laughs> right? Like hands in right position, head down, little things like that. Not these reverse sweeps or like these crazy shots you see in the international stage. It's like the basics, can you do them first? It's the same with comes here. So it's hammering home the basics with people, focusing on that. And just come into the realization that sadly, when people come to you for the first time, for everyday people over 30, they want one or two things, fat loss or muscle building, or sometimes both, <laughs> all right? That is the performance related people tend to go try and do their own thing for a long time until they break down and get injured. But fat loss is the biggest driver. Everyone wants to know the secrets to fat loss. It's not really that secret anymore. Like everyone should know it, but it's just the, the case of applying it or knowing which steps to take first. And everyone wants to build lean muscle because they want to look good for the beach, <laughs> you know? Um, and those, that's where we're at really right now. It's like really honing our fat loss 
programs and protocols for everyday people because we know there's two branches to take with people now when it comes in with fat loss and it usually links to diet and nutrition um, and it's knowing which branch to take um, depending on the mindset of the person who comes with us because there are very two very distinct types we can work with from there. Excellent. I mean, I've, I've, I'm wearing a, a polar heart rate monitor, which I, when I read your book, I think maximum aerobic power and you, you, you reference a lot of, uh, you know, Phil Maffetone and that sort of thing and the importance of building a, a broad aerobic base. Um, and we've had Brad Kearns on a few times awesome. who, who works with Mark Sissons, you know, and uh, in, in the kind of endurance world and primary endurance and that sort of thing. So that's really changed uh, things for me, you know, having, uh, you know, when, I, when I'm doing my uh, steady state kind of cardio and at the math, the math sort of level. Um, so, so you reference there sort of two, um, channels that you find that people, people want to, you could take people down, but I, I suppose the first thing, do people actually use the terms with you, uh, fat loss and, and muscle building or do people tend to use, cause we, we tend to hear obviously weight loss and toning up or something yeah. is what the kind of the general public would kind of use if they come to you or something I want to lose weight and I want to tone up you know is yeah, that that's 100% we get the same sort of thing I just kind of paraphrase it a little bit to fat loss um like yeah people say I want to lose weight um the older they are they want to say I want to, I want to feel healthier as you say yeah which kind of goes back to fat loss <laughs> um a little bit in tying into here but it's it is interesting like it is it's it's the weight loss side of things the fat loss the toning up as comes a byproduct of all that sort of stuff uh, that people really are coming for now most of the time. We do get like, I'd say, you know, 80% of our people are to lose weight and get stronger. That's 80% of the people. But then we do get performance related people coming to us as well, but it's very few and far between um, who are performance related. Because a lot of performance related people, well, we're not trying to aim for them. I think that's not our target market. We either push them elsewhere or they specifically want to work with us. Um, but yeah, weight loss is an interesting thing. Were you looking to we, did you have multiple different strands that you were pushing before and then you just realized that most people were attracted to those two areas and therefore you just, you know, move, moved your focus? So we, how did it evolve to that? Yeah, no, 100%. Like, so we get over the years, you're just trying to refine your message. And I wanted to go back, I went away from PT kind of coaching courses and stuff like that. Not, not when I'm never going to do it again. But the point was we moved away to stuff I enjoy doing and helping people and getting back to helping people. And it was the same message all the time. It was always people over 30 and they always needed to lose weight. Pretty much everybody needed to lose weight and body fat. And they all needed to get stronger, become more mobile and stuff like that. But so we just try to refine the message. So not everyone comes to us want to be more mobile. We know they need mobility, but they don't necessarily ask for it. But it was the more listening to the people asking us questions. And it was, yeah, it was literally a case, I just need to lose weight, tone up, get a bit stronger. I was like, ah, oh, okay. Um, we can do that to help you live better. So our tagline now is that we help people over 30 lose weight, get stronger, live better, because that's essentially what we do in a nutshell. Uh, but it just came over the years, just listening to people and asking the right questions and looking back at all the, the PDFs of the, you know, the online type forms we had people fill out as questionnaires and it came into us basically. Messaging is quite important, isn't it? I mean, one thing that we, you talked about was, was com confusion. And um, it's quite easy as a trainer to, to be very technical. It's also you know, one of the reasons everything's so confusing is that there are so many terms and ter so many approaches out there. And so when you have clarity of messaging, you can obviously underneath that, just like the iceberg, you know, with the tip of the iceberg, mm -hmm. you can have that more, more nuanced approach. I mean, I have a 28 day program. Do I think everyone can reach their entire goals in 28 days? Of course they don't, but it does allow people to come kind of create a mental framework to start building upon uh, and it sounds like you've done the same. So you've, you've got these central tenets of fat loss and hypertrophy. And then underneath that, you're, I suspect you're giving them what they want and, and quite a bit of what they need as well. Yeah, yeah, very much so. What they want, what they need is two very different things half the time. It really, really is. So you be, you've got to give them a little bit to make them hook them onto you and keep them with you. But at the same time, they need a lot of stuff they don't need, like mobility or whatever it is. Like, you know, it could be anything. Uh, heart work, you know, look where I say heart work, you know what I mean? Not, I'm not going to see, you know, <laughs> opening up the heart and stuff, but cardio work, I mean, um, in that sort of sense. But yeah, but it's like, it can't, like it, there is so much confusion. You said you hit the nail on the head there. There's so many different ways to skin a cat. Um, there's so many different ways to approach things. And that's why you go back to the WWS. It's walk, water, sleep, triple seven rule. 
We can all pretty much agree on that. We all need to walk more, move, move blood, move lymph. We all need to drink water, if not, we die. <laughs> And uh, similar to sleep, if we don't sleep, we die, <laughs> you know, in a, in a nutshell. So out of everything in fitness, I think we can all fundamentally agree, okay, we may disagree on how much of each thing you need to do, and that's okay. That's why 7,000 is a little moderate, and like baseline, we didn't need to go more or less, you know, baseline moderate to be as agnostic as possible in the sense of uh, when it comes to this sort of stuff, but as a baseline. Um, so we can all agree on that. And then when we have these basics in place, then we can start to explore um, certain things. Now let's just take fat loss. One of the, you know, without a doubt, um, nutrition plays the most important part when it comes to fat loss, in my, in my opinion. Now, some people will disagree with me, and that's okay, <laughs> right? This, that's the beauty of it. But my, if, what I've seen now is you get the nutrition bit right, first and foremost, you, they will lose, people will lose weight. Um, I can give a case in point with my dad recently, who two months ago got diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. He's needed to kick up his ass for a long time to go and lose some weight, but he wasn't in the right mindset. Um, partly due to he had, he had bowel cancer 15 years ago. He's had 14 major operations ever since that day, and he's, been, he's gone from being an active farmer to being really sedentary. And it's my aunt, who was kind of like you know, a mother to him as well, died of type 1 diabetes four months prior. So that together was a real kick up in the ass for him. He weighed in at 17 stone two. So what's that? Got 130 kilos, something like that, um, a while ago. He weighed in this morning, because I checked in with him now every day, at 15 stone two, just literally two stone in just under two months. Uh, and he's just made little changes to his diet and food. The thing that we found with him was, which I, no one had any idea what he was doing, was he was having eight to 10 cups of instant coffee a day. Why you drink instant coffee that many times a day, I have no idea why. Not with teaspoons of sugar, two tablespoons of sugar in his coffee every day. Now, I figured that was about 1,200 calories alone in sugar, right? And so the first thing we did was we just took that out. That's all we did. <laughs> Miraculously, his blood getting better and he's losing weight. <laughs> you know, that's like literally 8,000 calories a week we've cut out from his day-to-day -day life. But the point is, I can't remember my point, but I kind of digress here, but, but that's great, it goes to the point of weight loss. For us, it, it does come down to nutrition and it comes down to the basics, but also getting people, particularly over 30, to a point where they're ready to handle fat loss workouts. Now, what I mean by that is, is if you want, really want to maximize your fat loss gains, because it's bloody hard. Losing fat and body fat and weight is bloody hard, right? When it comes to the workout side of things. And to do it, we, we kind of call it the four horsemen. You need, to, you need to do strength training. You need to do alactic anaerobic stuff. You need to do some form of metabolic conditioning. And you need to do some form of low intensity cardio. It's the four horsemen, as we call it, right? Hard, alactic, anaerobic stuff is freaking hard. It's the stuff, that, it's the shitty shit shit that you want to spew up at the end of the day, right? You know, heavy strength training, it's going to be hard work. You need time to recover. People need to be prepared to be able to handle that sort of stuff first and foremost. Because if their body's not right, their mindset's not right, it's going to be harder to lose weight in the long term. So when we talk about fat loss now, we go, okay, well, is this person fit and ready and able and mobile enough to handle the complexity of this type of training long-term to get maximize their fat loss results, yes or no? If it's a no, then we have this conversation with them, say, look, let's focus on the diet maybe, and let's just maintain the strength and mobility and get you to a place to where you can get to. It may take three, four, six months to get ready for that fat loss thing, but I promise you, you will lose weight faster when everything's in a good place and you're ready to go. Um, we did a case study, Jerome Wester from, um, from the Netherlands, like he was a good case study. He was six months in pain um, and we didn't do any fat loss. He didn't, lose, he didn't lose any weight in six months. We said, look, stick with us. We need to get you out of pain, get you moving better first, and then we'll go to weight loss. Then the final four months between August, August, September, October, November, literally four, four and a half months, he dropped 22 kilos, right? Because he was ready to do the hard training. He had his nutrition dialed down from this basic work we'd be doing beforehand, and then boom, we could attack it. So. I think I've gone off a little. Is that where the fork in the road is? You know, you said you've got kind of two a two prong sort of approach. Where so is is that the fork in the road where you separate people if they're ready to to kind of take on training initially, 
they'll go down one path and if they're not they'll go down the other path is that well it's almost like two to begin with so like the, the first one so like so we, we the first thing we check is is wws in check yes or no um yes okay so assume it is great next next fork it's going to be the nutrition question we need to have this nutrition conversation so this is where the fork starts to happen then comes back in does that make sense like to here to come here so like first question is okay is that does this person see nutrition and calories as data or are they scared shitless of the scales and scared shitless of counting calories or that's very you know very crude way of saying it but it's, it's two ways like you have people who are very love the data and love tracking and you got the people who do not want to track and scared about stepping on the scales and going here the approach we take with both of those is very very different you know like you're not going to get the people who don't like counting to count calories um, in any way, that becomes habit-based, it becomes more intuitive, and there's other means to do it. So that's the first fork, so like you know, where we go. Is through through a platform that it has preset stuff, or is it a very much a one-to-one -one relationship? That's a one-to-one -one relationship. So when, when it comes to the, uh, the initial consultation call when we work with people, we're asking them these questions right at the start. They look, if they're fat loss, that is, you know, and we start having the conversation, have you, you know, tell me about your nutrition. You know, what have you done in the past? What's worked for you? What hasn't worked for you? Have you tried counting calories? And then we get a gist of how things work with people. Um, so a lot of people who do. Now, we, the best results we get are the ones that people we track with. They're the ones who get the results the fastest. They're the ones who see it as data and are not so emotionally involved with what's going on. Yeah. Um, not saying it's right, not saying it's wrong. But we just see we just see they're more specific and clinical. With their, it takes the randomness out of it. I mean, it, yeah. you know, like at any. I, mean, I was talking to a client today about stuff, and it was like you, you, you know, you manage you manage projects, don't you? So you, you're planning, you're, you're you're doing the details, you're, you're and then you're executing the, the the project based on prep work you've done, but you're not doing that at all with your diet, and you're getting a total random result. So it's it's, it's kind of not surprising that people who plan and prep and play with the data. Have a much more predictable outcome than, than those that don't. You know, it, it is. And this is what we see, and that's that's you know that's what we try and what we we know we can get the best results the fastest if we push down that line. But we're never going to push somebody down it because they've had a really bad experience. We need to earn their trust, and maybe long late later when we've hit, we've got some results work here. Um, but it's you know it's, it's how we we work it in the first instance. So that, that's the first question. So which way are we going to go? Okay, we know it's going to be nutrition based. After W W S comes first. Then it's nutrition, which fork do we go down? Then we come back in the middle and go, is this person ready, fit, and able to handle fat loss workouts? Yes, it's a simple yes or no. And that means through our testing, through our layer system testing, like if, if it's a simple, if, it's a, if most of the time it's a no. So we know we need to do a lot of like general strength training, um, full body movements, um, a lot of mobility work, getting their body prepared to handle hard fat loss workouts. And that's the difference, because fat loss is hard. It's, you, 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 you need high motivation, because you can, you can have times when your energy sucks. <laughs> uh, you, you, you'll want to eat that pizza, or you, whatever you're going to do, you need to have strong willpower. So you've got to be, get somebody in the right mindset to get them to do the fat loss workout. And that's where it all comes in, tying is where, where does everything come first? So it's, it's that sort of branch we're doing now is going, where are they at in that initial stage? And great, and then we can move forward. But like the entire time, we remain nutritionally agnostic. I think that's the best word to put it. Uh, we do not prescribe to any one type of diet. Uh, it's about finding the right diet that works for you. But we try and start in the middle. So if you imagine that you've got the carnivore diet on one side, you've got, then you've got veganism on the other side. <laughs> Right, so the two here. We want to start in the middle, and it usually starts with. Let's take the approach when we're counting calories, tracking calories, because this is the one we've really nailed down recently and got it right. Always, 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 we just want people to track for the first month, first four weeks. They're tracking to see where they're at. What we see most of the time is that most men chronically overeat. Most women chronically undereat. Okay, for where they should be, where we can guesstimate and work out what the calorie maintenance is. Are they tracking on something like My Fitness Pal or the My Fitness Pal? Yeah, super, okay. super easy. You know, but right, for people out there listening, going, I'm scared of tracking calories. Don't worry, I'm not, I'll get to you guys in a second. <laughs> right? Can I, can I just ask? 
where, just through the people that you uh, that you that come to you, I would imagine that that people who certainly people with a uh, you know maybe who who are kind of quite overweight, maybe they've been overweight for a long time. I'd imagine that most of them would fall into the camp where they're almost kind of emotionally driven with food and they're probably anti-tracking. Yeah. Do you find that, that I know you probably get the, the quickest and the best results with people who are a bit more methodical and logical about it, but would you say in terms of the numbers, more people who come to you are the kind of the anti-tracking habit-based people? Yeah, 100%, 100%. I'd, I'd say 60-40 in the sense of like anti-tracking. But if you take someone who's like obese, and if I use the obese term as, you know, the BMI over 30, you know, as a very simplistic way to do it, um, just by doing WWS, walking more, drinking more water and sleeping more, you tend to lose weight. And I'm not going to ask somebody to step on a scale like if we can see what's in front of us already because it's going to make them feel even worse. And I don't, that's the last thing I want to do. A lot of people, a lot of trainers and coaches, not saying you guys because you know, we're all part of the same inner circle and like this secret club of like good trainers, I like to think of ourselves, right? Who, who kind of been around the world and know it, but... There's a lot of people with fat shaming. There's a lot of in the gyms and stuff like that. You see, it's 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 just it's horrendous. It's a shit show. I think that's the best way to put it. I think you know the fitness show, fitness industry is horrible most of the time. Um, so yeah, no. But for the people who are like that, and don't worry about that. There's other ways to do it, and it starts with walking more, drinking more water, and you naturally start to feel better and make better food choices. Uh, it's the psychology. I think people know that that's probably the right way to do it, but then when they're faced with someone saying well, we can, we, can, we can take a global overview, we can track these things, we can work on the basic thing. Oh, is that fitness? Yeah. You know, like you say, it goes back to that, that a confusion around what is, what, is, what is the best method of getting fit? What well, is the best so we come back to the nutrition side. Again, it's, it, when we're talking about fat loss, we've got to talk about nutrition. I, I'm really sorry that people, you know, a lot of people, I, I bought into it at some point and I tried so many times to like realize that, hey, I can try and, you know, I can out train my diet. I can try and do it. No, I was, I just got fat. <laughs> that's the best way to put it. Um, and I'm I'll be honest. We do the A12, and, and that's a very, very focused program. But it, I know the people who do the diet, and I know people who don't. You know, and you're training yep. five days a week on that program yep. with barbells. You know, it's it, it's a great program. It really is. It really works really, really well. And again, it is. It does come down to diet, but like it's. So when we, when we see people now, so it got back to this whole carnivore veganism, right? I always use these two examples because they are the two extremes of the, of the dieting world. And like, you know, it's easier to change somebody's religion than it is to change somebody's diet sometimes. I think that's the best way to put it, right? Um, but anyway, we start from the middle. People don't talk about it, politics, religion, and now it's diet. It just hits the well clear of all of that. Yep. So keep oh. listening. No, it really is, literally. Yeah, my, 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 my dinner conversation with all that politics, religion, uh, guns, US politics, diet, and kettlebells. Those, those are my six things that I do not, you know, like I just stay out of the world of like conversations with. Like, that's probably why I have no friends. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's just, it's just comedy. But if we go back to this, this middle bit here. So like, what we can all agree on is that you know, okay, so this is what we see, and I think a lot of people see the same thing. Most guys are overeating, most women are undereating. The way you handle those two is very different. We'll get to that in a second. But the point is, in the middle, is that, okay, well, let's start with a balanced macronutrient table of proteins, carbs, and fats, and fiber, if you want to include fiber as well. Um, so we start off in the middle. So, okay, what's just a, a good starting point to do? Protein needs to be high, probably three, four times more than what people are already eating, sometimes 10 times higher right than what they need to be now carbs and fats are basically the same thing it sounds ridiculous but it's almost the same thing it's just you want to find your balance and that's the difference between uh, keto and like high carb you know you're just manipulating the carbs and fats protein is going to be high whether it's vegan protein uh, which i eat a lot of by the way because i i'm intolerant to dairy um or here yeah, you're just manipulating the carbs and fats to find the right balance for you now some people will do really well with higher carbohydrates some people will do really badly with high carbs. I do really badly with high carbs. Um, I had a pizza on the on the World, on the European Cup final of the week, and like I put on two and a half kilos, but in two days because of water retention from that pizza. And I know I just I just wear it. I go I don't care, but I'm going to do it. It'll take about a week and a half to come off, but that's just how I react to carbohydrates. But other people are fine. 
Um, so I have to have more fats in my diet than carbs. But we start off in the middle, like a good baseline. Is this working for you? Are you losing weight like this? Yes or no? Great, you are. Most of the time, people are. <laughs> they're eating the right amount of calories. They're eating in a good balance. Okay, cool. Then when you've mastered what we call your maintenance calories, okay, which we want to work, because most people have no idea how many calories they need to stay at the same level. No idea. You know, they all go, yeah, I, I need to eat 1,200 calories to lose weight. Do you? How many calories do you need to eat to eat to stay the same? All right, and they will not be able to tell you that, left, right, or center. So How are you working that out track for a month? Say again? How are you working that one out? Are you, do you have a particular formula? Well, we got, we, got, we got a lot of data, like as in calculators, we've spreadsheets we've used over time to create the data behind it. But what we, what we, you can't beat trial and error. I think we can, we can guesstimate the amount of calories they need, but this is why we get people to track for a month. We wanna see how much they're eating over the course of a month. Have they lost weight, have they gained weight? And usually you know, we, we get a rough idea. We don't tell them anything. We just say, just track, and then we, we'll, we'll pull in the data into our coaching system and we'll have a look at it. And we'll, have they lost weight? Have they gained weight? What, what is going on here? What is their average per week, per daily allowance? And that's the first thing, because we wanna see what their maintenance is. What is their maintenance? Because the, it'll, it's a longer approach, but the quicker we can find your maintenance, the quicker we can find your deficit. Okay, right? And this, this is what people are overeating, by the way, okay? People are, most women who are under eating, different ball game, different ball game altogether, right? Um, and this is also for normal people, we, we, you know, like in the sense of like people whose metabolisms are fairly normal, <laughs> I think is the best way to put it. But that's what we start off here. That's the key thing that we've discovered. Find out your maintenance, then we start um, playing around with macros, but then we just want to see if, are you maintaining weight? Which some people are scared about because they want to see instant results. It's the snowball effect. Take your time to work on maintenance and then the results will get faster and you'll always know then in the long term what you need to do to cut <laughs> uh, and vice versa. Um, but when it comes to like, let's take most women who are under eating, right? We wanna see their maintenance and we do the four week thing as well. The hardest conversation we have to have to a lot of people who are trying to lose weight is to try and get them to eat more calories, right? To allow, so example, two weeks ago, somebody came into us, we calculated their uh, TD to be like two, total, total daily expenditure for those that don't know, uh, to be 1,850 calories, right? That was their, their maintenance level we calculated based on our fancy calculations to be. Uh, they were eating 1,150 on average and they had done so for years. And we know that because they tracked for years, right? So guess what happened when we asked them to put on th eat 1,300 to 1,400 calories? They put on an extra couple of pounds each week, right? So which, because their body becomes so used to this level of calories, their body adapted to it, that we had to keep reassuring, it's okay, just, just stick with us, stick with us here now, it's okay. Yes, you put, we'll dial it down a little bit. It took us six months, right, for most people to get them back up to a normal eating level of calories right, before we can even talk diets, because they're already in a calorie deficit to what they should be eating. And it's, it's nothing more miserable than if you're eating 1,100 calories a day, well, okay, maybe you've stayed under 600 calories a day. That is just shit, <laughs> right? And it ain't work. So it's it's a different ball game how we do, but it's, I think I've gone from a massive tangent here now, but this is where we're really dialing our work on at the moment. It's like, well, look, Nutrition is important, get them to maintenance, work around this sort of level here, and then we adjust accordingly, but think for the long term, and then work out what are their, are their bodies ready and able to handle fitness? Because if not, doing the diet and not being ready to handle a hard fat loss program is a recipe for disaster. They implode, they don't lose weight, they walk away even more frustrated than ever before. I like this idea of data-led training uh, because I think it's quite easy to have your own kind of, I mean, a lot of people, we've talked about narratives, you know, they can't, people have an idea of what they think is working or what they think is contributing to it. And it often becomes this kind of personal truth thing. And actually sometimes the data can be quite stark. It can be quite revealing and it can tell you whether or not you're, you're being honest with yourself. And, and I think a lot of, uh, and I'll, I'll be interested to hear your, your thoughts on this, when you when people come face to face with the reality of the data, and it goes against what they believe is happening, what how do people react? 
do, do they have light bulb moments or is there denial or is it a sense that like uh, some, something else? I mean, because it's, you know, data doesn't often lie as long as they're recording things correctly. Yeah, well, uh, you have to trust that they are, I suppose. Exactly. Data doesn't lie. And this is, this, you've got to realize that data is more important than feelings sometimes. And you sometimes, it depends how you communicate with them. You can't tell them, oh, you fat, you know, you know, you, you've got to do this. It's, it's, you can just say to them, hey, look, this is what we're seeing. But it's how you, it's, it's your bedside manner, how you communicate to them here. Yeah. But sometimes we always take the honest approach and realizing that you've got to work out the person in front of you. Like some, like I work with quite a few military guys, so I can tell them bluntly because they respond better to blunt, you know, upfront, honestly, hey, mate, you're being a fat this week, right? Sort your, sort your shit out. I won't say that to Grandma Betty, who is like, you know, hey, look, uh, well done this week, you know, but try next week to do something else. It's, it's, a, it's about having that bit. We still want to communicate the truth. I think that the truth isn't the most important thing, but it's how you deliver the truth to the people that's the most important. Now, just going back to data, one of the most important data facts that we've I've discovered and use now in any conversation, particularly when I'm working somewhere for the first time, is, and I learned this from Andrew Reid, and one of his mates did this a while ago, was you take your height in centimeters, this is for men, first of all, height in centimeters, minus 100, and that should be around what your ideal weight is. Now, bear with me on this, right? Minus five is for the elite athletes who are more endurance-based. Plus five is for the power-based guys like wrestlers, crossfitters, stuff like that. You go online, you will, you will find some outliers. You put in some of the biggest names in fitness, right, and sports and athletes. This is for athletes, okay, not powerlifters. Sorry, powerlifters, I'm not going to shit all over you guys again, but I quite enjoy it, <laughs> right? right? Proper athletes. Proper athletes, right? Proper athletes. Um, you go in there and you literally, you'll do it and you'll see it comes, it's so uncanny. You'll see all your best tennis players, football players, soccer players, football players, whatever you want to call it, they all fit into this kind of mold. Like rugby, particularly for like halfbacks um, and you know, in, in the back, in, in the back, the front row, not so much because it's, it's an outlier. It's a very different position, right? Same with NFL linemen, you know, it's a very different contact type sport. But if you, if you take the runners, cyclists, they all fit into this category. Height in centimeters, minus 100 for men, minus, plus or minus five, minus is more for the endurance thing, plus five is for more of the power-based sports, and they all fit into that category. For women, it's minus 110, okay? So straight away with a conversation where someone, someone comes to me now, and they'll say to me, hey, um, I don't think I need to lose weight, um, I'm in a good position, I'm here. Okay, cool, I don't mean just how, how tall are you? Okay, so you're 180 centimeters. How much do you weigh? 96 kilos. Okay, so in my head, instantly, I'm not telling them this, but I'm instantly going, they're about 16 kilos overweight. Are you with me? So it becomes the conversation here, and it, I'm not telling people this, like until we get to know them better, but I already know this. Um, it's, it's, it was interesting with me, like when I started, because I, I looked at me particularly for cricket, because I'm still playing cricket at a, fair, a pretty semi-professional level. I'm one of the oldest guys in the team. And then when I did it to me, I, I'm 173 centimeters. And about two months ago, I realized I'm, shit, I'm 75 kilos. Most international cricketers are more than minus five, right, side of things. So my goal was to get down to about 71, 70. So we, I'm now at 72 today. But like it was a case of like, okay, well, I want to get down to 71 because I know it's other elite cricketers around that kind of level. So I need to maintain and prolong my career that way. So again, a bit of a tangent, but like something that we use in-house really well to distinguish and have this conversation of where people are at. Um, some people you can tell the information to, other people will get really butt hurt and they won't like it. But if someone comes to us and they say, hey, I want to get better at running, um, okay, cool. What's your weight? What's your height? Okay, I'm 180 kilo. I'm 180 centimeters. I weigh 102 kilos. Well, look. No matter what running program we're going to give you, you need to lose weight. Simple as that. It's as simple as that because elite runners are around 75, you know, 75 kilos. If I'm if I'm looking at those sort of numbers, um, and it just helps. It puts things in perspective to help people. You know, and time after time again, we get people coming to us as well. Not just they want fat loss, but there's other people come to us who want performance related goals, but the best performance related goal I can give them is fat loss. Uh, they just don't realize it yet. Yeah. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. um, I also like the, you know, I know you're obviously <clears throat> aware of the, you know, the, the Dan John one with the, the waist being less than half your height. Yep. Again, it's just, I, I like that though, that, because it's, it's just totally, it's straightforward. It's easy. It's like, like what you said with your calculation there. You can take someone's height, you can take their waist, you can very clearly explain, well, we want this to be around half and they can, and for a lot of people, then you can say, well, it's about four centimeters or five centimeters, you know, and it just gives you a nice place to start. And it does kind of, it takes the emotion out of it, doesn't it? It takes the, yeah. because it's like that, like you say, it's that data, you know, which is very, very, it's, very clear. It is, and that, that thing's come from thousands of data points. Somebody, some, some data analysts did all that. And we use waist to height ratio as well. It's our, you know, waist to heart ratio is one of our most important things we use to help people run. If it's over 0 0.5, we, we suggest to people that they shouldn't be running because the impact on their joints is going to be too high. Like it's, it's, it's such a good tool that is the waist to height ratio. But yeah, but it comes down to, you know, if we're talking about performance, I'll definitely want to use those numbers and have that conversation with people. If I'm talking about health for people, I'd like to see them around 100 minus, you know, their height and center is minus 100 or 110 for women. And the plus five, like, you know, if they're, if they're 180, again, if they're 180 and they weigh 85 kilos, as far as I'm concerned, that's in healthy ranges, right? That's in healthy ranges. Doesn't mean they're going to be performing their highest, but it just means they're in potentially healthy ranges. Um, and it works better than BMI or anything like that at all. It just gives a better indicator for us and how we do things. So, but it is, it's true. Again, we go back to the starting when we started, like fat loss. We say fat loss because a lot of people need fat loss, but the people who come to us for performance, they need fat loss. It's, it's, you know, like they want to run better and they're carrying 18% body fat. Until we get down towards 12%, mm. we're, we're, not, we're not in the ballpark here. It, it impacts you that much. That's why professional footballers are monitored to the nth degree to have below 10% body fat. Injury risk, performance related. <laughs> you know, horse racing is the key of it. You know, horse racing that looks at it all as well, the nth degree, stuff like that. So I've, no, got, I've, got, I've kind of gone off on one there a little bit. No, I was gonna say, so, so, we, so the data is fascinating and you've got all the data that you use for people who are kind of pro tracking and they're kind of logical. And uh, it reminds me, we had, we had a guy called Chris Zaremba on a few weeks ago who, who, um, who went from being obese to kind of a, a fitness model, you know, doing the, 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 st the st stuff on stage. And he was a spreadsheet kind of guy, you know, and he yep. packed everything to the nth degree, loved his spreadsheets and, and it was fascinating. And he was in computer programming, so it was, it was great for him. But for the majority of people, like you say, maybe the 60% of people who come to you who are, who are sort of averse to tracking and they've got more emotional stuff going on, what, what route do you take them on to begin with? So yes, good, great question because I, I I do I, I love the data. I mean, I'm a data person. I love the data. I can chat about it for hours. <laughs> you know, like I geek out on this sort of stuff. If that makes sense, and I, I can geek out with you guys for sort of sense. So um, when it comes to people who don't like to track here, first thing is, is like, well, look, where are they at? Where are they at in their career? Are they? Uh, do they have a BMI of over thirty? If so, then we ain't gonna track. Not for, not for a while. Not for yet. We want them to get them moving. We want them to feeling good about themselves. Because right now, we don't need to tell them they feel like crap because they already feel like crap and they know they feel like crap. You know, it's the last thing we need to do with people, you know, in that terms. We want to help them get them to their first step. What's their first step on the fitness ladder? So, WWS, are they walking, water, sleeping? You know, that's, you know, that's, that's the starting point here. Great. Okay, let's increase this a little bit. Let's start going a bit more and doing more of it. Walking more is walking probably more important than the exercise part. Let's get them exercising. Okay, let's start people exercising more. Let's get a habit and a routine of exercising maybe two, three, four times a week if they're lucky and start from there. And when they start to feel better about themselves, then we can have a food conversation, right? And it, there's multiple ways you can do this. One of the ones that we like to do is to say, hey, daily task, take a picture of every piece of food that passes your mouth um, over the course of this week. Just do me a favor, just take a quick photo on your phone, upload it here so we can see what's going on and see what happens. Again, nine times out of 10, uh, you'll see beige. Like it is beige. You'll see um, convenience food bought from like any shop, like even garages, petrol stations, things out of packets. Uh, it's, it's all processed food uh, that isn't very colorful. Um, so, when it comes to things like this, like, yes, we know calories in, calories out matter. That is the be all and end all. But quality of food matters too. 
So we can start them off on, on the quality of the food they're eating and find some fun ways and habits to get people into the right routine. So it's, you know, I think the food, taking food pictures works really well um, as a starting point for a lot of people, not everybody, but it's a good starting point here. So it's a case of like, okay, well look, we're not gonna count calories, even though we know it's important. So we're gonna focus on the other thing that's really important, which is the quality of the food that you have. You know, what are you eating for food? Okay, I'm getting my protein from sausages. Okay, can we change your sausages to maybe chicken or turkey breast or something along those lines? It's just, it's just changing the ways and thinking and giving the freedom or thought to go, actually, I don't have to buy that, um, those sandwiches from Tesco's and Marks and Spencer's, right? I can go home and cook some really good lean meat or something, something along those lines or whatever it is, we find ways to, to find simple ways to improve the quality of the food that they're consuming. Um, and that's, it starts from there. And when they get comfortable with, well with that, then we lead them on to the next step. Well, how much are you eating? It comes, then comes the precision nutrition style of like palm size, thumb size, you know, fist size of types of food. But we go back to the calorie counting for a second. I don't want everybody counting calories for the rest of their life. Like, I just want you to know the basics of what, how that works. So you can go away from tracking and then you can do whatever you want. But if you go, oh, you know what, I need to lose a couple of kilos, gangs, I put a couple of kilos on, you'd always have that skill in your locker to pull out and go, right, I know my baseline is 2,800, but, and I know if I pull down to 2,100 and do this for a couple of weeks, I'll drop a couple of kilos. <laughs> you have that skill to pull out whenever you want it. So it's easy to maintain your weight long-term once you have that skill in place. But then you, t- you want to wean people off it into the more habit-based first anyway. So, so when we go counting calories, we take them into habit-based afterwards, or if we go to habit-based first, we kind of want to go them into the counting calories after that. So, so we're still leading back to the same sort of methods each time. Does that make sense? Yeah, because we, we had um, we had Josh Hillis on actually a while ago, who, um, you know, I know you know Josh, obviously, yeah. and, um, and we had the lean and strong. And it's quite interesting that, that yeah, so for the people who don't like to track, I suppose you're, you're using more, or you're not using it more, you're using a different kind of coaching skill set, aren't you, with those yeah. people where it's a lot more... Um, nuanced and a lot kind of softer and a lot more like you say habit based and emotive and kind of uh, coaxing behaviors and and he talks a lot obviously about um you know eating skills and behavior practice and that sort of thing and then the other side is is still coaching and it's still skill based but it's far more like you say the numbers and the metrics and the yeah. data and 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 that and those that's that's fantastic and um and like you say then you're moving from the from the kind of habit based into the metrics and, and the data or from the data into the habits so, exactly because yeah. you, you got to live like that's the most important thing like you you know food is such a social event and such a fun thing to be a part of like you want to be a part of this fun stuff and enjoy everything that life has to offer um like i said like i'm intolerant to dairy and i don't do well with carbs so i've bought this really dirty pizza from the big square pizza company in cardiff because it tastes so bloody good but it's such a dirty pizza it's not the finest italian thing you'll ever have it was a great thing to eat in fact so I, I yeah i ate it but i just know that for the next few days i will put on weight 2.5 kilos in my case and i will retain water but what i do the, the following days afterwards is i just eat make sure i'm eating i say healthier but more cleaner like more lean meats less processed carbohydrates, like just stick to like, you know, porridge oats, <laughs> you know, and some good potatoes, sweet potatoes, something like that, and leaner protein like tuna, fish, turkey. And by the end of the week, I'm back to normal again. <laughs> it's, it's having that realization because you, you, you shouldn't deprive yourself of foods. So that's like, it's too much, life's too much fun to enjoy. <laughs> And I was going to wonder, we've obviously looked at the, the, you know, we've been talking about the the kind of diet and nutrition side of the equation for the fat loss. Uh, you did obviously mention uh, and touch on the kind of the training side. And you said people have to be, you know, ready physically and emotionally and, uh, you know, uh, with their kind of commitment level to kind of then go into the training. Um, but can we touch on on some of those sort of elements of training that you would you would work on people for through your sort of fat loss protocols and that sort of thing yeah so the, the first thing the first thing we want to get people to be is they need to be strong enough um and they need to have a good cardio base i think that's the per- first most important thing if they're not strong enough then no matter how much strength training well it's going to improve them 
but it's not going to maximize their fat loss results. We want to be in a fat loss phase as, for as little as possible. We don't want to be in a fat loss phase for like two years. That's going to suck, <laughs> right? You know, maybe in some cases, we want to be, you know, so we're going to be strong enough. So when I say strong enough, you know, good simple guidelines is can a man deadlift 1.5 times his body weight for five reps? Not, not a huge amount of times. And for females, 1.25, that's a good starting point. Um, can they, uh, we do the functional capacity test, so they, can they carry the half their body weight, uh, the three quarters of their body weight, sorry, for 90 seconds in a split over two hands? So do they have that basic strength to, to do these things? If not, then we need to work them towards it. Now, it'll help them lose weight as well because they're getting stronger, building muscle, but to go to a real hardcore fat loss plan, you need to have basic strength so we can really dive into using the, you know, all these strength reserves, essentially. And also when it comes to cardio, if we haven't got a baseline cardio, um, you're not gonna recover fast enough. You simply will not recover fast enough and you're gonna feel like crap and it's not gonna last very long. So we need a strong cardio base for your ability to recover faster because when we go into that fat loss phase, we talk, we, I talk about the four horsemen, you want um, heavy strength training, right? And I'm talking heavy, like you know, you're going to failure a lot of the times. Um, you want any mixing muscle sets between 12 reps down to three to five reps, depending on how you plan it out. So, you want to be heavy. Um, you want to do some kind of metabolic conditioning, uh, metcons, which will involve kettlebell kind of complexes, it could do. It could involve like an assault bike, followed by push ups, followed by whatever it is, right? Some kind of metabolic thing. So, those are the two things here. You then need to do um, low intensity cardio. Uh, and there's a fourth one I've missed out here. What have I missed out? Anaerobic, uh, metabolic, strength training, cardio. There we go. <laughs> so those are the four ones. Yeah. Anaerobic, you know, alactic type, really hardcore sprints. Think of sprints, right? You need to be ready for that. But is your body re prepared and ready for that? Uh, alactic, shitty shit shit, uh, metabolic conditioning, and um, uh, low intensity cardio. That's hard work. That is really hard work. If you want to do a really hard, intense session that lasts for 45 minutes and do max strength finish by heavy sprints at the end, it sucks. It really sucks. And if your body's not robust enough, you're gonna break down. And it follows the training cycle of getting injured and off, injured, off, injured, off, all the way around. So that's the key thing is like, well, get yourself strong enough, get yourself cardio cardiovascularly fit enough before you dive into the actual strength training side of things and the hard stuff. Now, do you find that if you if you start correcting some of the kind of the low hanging fruit, if you like, early on and, and people, you know, they're upping their water, they're upping their steps, they're upping their sleep, they're, they're, they're getting stronger, they're, they're moving more, they, they're, you know, they're starting to eliminate more of the kind of the overly processed kind of hyper palatable foods, that sort of thing. Yeah. By the time you actually come to to enter kind of like a fat loss phase, I'd imagine they've made considerable progress by the time they even get exactly. there, mate. Exactly, that's a good. That's a good way to think about it as well. So, like, I'll give you just plain examples. So, everyone wants to know what the what the elite are doing, you know, here now. So, as far as most people who come to us, and most, I'm sure most people you guys will work with, and most people out there will have a body fat percentage of over twenty percent. Right, over twenty percent is a beginner in when it comes to fat loss. Like, as as far as I'm concerned, right, because. You know, what we, what we know from the data is that healthy ranges are between 10 and 20%, okay? Depending on where you want to sit. For men, women it's 20 to 30, or 22 to 30, I think it is, one of the two. So we're over 20%, we do anything when it comes to diet, nutrition, fitness, movement, exercise, doing more, you're gonna get down to maybe probably around 15, 16%, right? Now, when we get down to 15% body fat, things change, it's it's gonna be a lot harder. Some people will find it easy to get down to like say 12, 13%. Uh, other people are gonna find it bloody hard. Um, and this is where the hard training comes in. So if you, if you want to, this, this four horsemen apply really for, for men who are under literally 15% 15 body fat or under, and for women you're talking more like under 25%. Uh, and that's all it, but the rest really of the time- really I, think, I think when we were talking earlier, I can, I can, I can envisage quite a few of our listeners and quite a few of the people that I kind of know maybe getting a bit scared, <laughs> you know, when you're saying about, you know, this is hard training to get the fat loss and blah, blah, blah. But when, 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 when I'm thinking of, of, of a lot of people, yeah. they may be like you say, you know, 30%, 40% body exactly. plus, 
So the fat loss for them is is not, uh, you know, it doesn't hard process. Quite such hard work, does it? But when you just clarified there and you said, actually, so really what you're talking about is getting lean, isn't it? Yeah. And getting lean from, say, 15% down, which yeah. is, you know, more like a kind of athletic kind of level of lean rather than an everyday person. Um, you know, if someone's 40% now and they get to 20%, they can probably get to 20% fairly, uh, you know, yeah. moderate, moderately, you know, yeah. without the kind of hard work and the rest of it. Yeah, with, with basic dietary intervention and just training consistently. And again, I, I don't believe that most people over 30 should train to exhaustion or to extremes because they got life. It's like you're talking like life, kids, work, you know, hobbies, other fun stuff. Like, so we don't, we, you don't, we haven't got the time or the energy resources to put into everything like this. And like, like I said, to get somebody down to sub 10% body fat or sub 15% body fat for women, it's commitment, it's hard work, it's extreme fitness, okay? Whereas to get you, to get somebody down below 25% for women, I think it's a really easy, manageable goal that everybody can achieve. And likewise for men, anyone, but to get down to about 15%, I think anybody can achieve that as well. Um, and it doesn't have to be, it means just working, just being consistent and working within the 80% type of rule and being consistent over time. And you can get there really easy. But it's for those who want to get lean, that's why I talk about the four horsemen, that's that's the, the different level, again, of where people want to get to. But strength train, do some cardio training. Um, if you want to do a bit of hit and you want to enjoy it, do a bit of hit. That's cool by me. Just don't make it your sole exercise thing that you do because it'll just burn you out. Um, and just start eating healthier. Like just, I say eating healthier, just like bear in mind what we spoke about today is like, figure out, are you a data person or are you a habit-based person? Um, what do you prefer? You know, either way, it works. There's a, there's a way and a means to help you get to where you want to get to. Just understand that, no, learn the fundamentals of fitness. Uh, which is WWS, <laughs> then learn the fundamentals of nutrition. You know, even if you're scared about counting calories, it's a good idea to work out what your maintenance calories are. Just have a rough idea in your head. Um, doesn't mean you have to track. Doesn't mean you have to follow them at all. But it's a good idea. Don't use any of those fancy calculators you see online because most of them are wrong. I promise you this now. They are so far wrong, you wouldn't believe it. Um, um, but yeah, just bear, just bear that in mind um, and then choose the option that's best for you. But like I said, it's all about living better, living longer and having fun. And if you're not having fun with fitness, you're never going to stick to anything. And if it's miserable, like, well, no one, no one wants to do anything that's miserable for the time, except for bodybuilders who, they, they're being miserable for a reason. They want to get to that like, <laughs> tiny percent. They want to get in that little budgie smuggler on stage. and. Uh, I really like that. I really like the, the you know, the, the kind of the, the idea of the, you know, taking a path and splitting and taking a path and splitting and, and, and having that, you know, that, that, that flexibility and that not one size fits all approach. And even looking at, um, you know, the way people, where people are starting from and their kind of preferences and their emotional kind of state at the time. And, you know, if they're a data person, if they're not a data person, I think that, I think that's fantastic. Yeah, it's really good. Um, <laughs> I'm aware of time. I think we'll, we'll, we'll probably start to wrap up here. And I mean, we've obviously oh. had you on before and I'm sure we'll have you on again, James. That, <laughs> Anytime. I think you, 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 you gave us the gems last, last time of the 777, you know, the WWS. And you also gave us the, because another thing that a lot of my members were doing was the walking test that I think you spoke yeah. about. Yeah. Um, was it, what, remind, remind people about that one. 1.5 1. miles in 20 minutes. Yes. That's or 2.41 two, or 2 kilometers. Yeah, and it's that tough. really, yeah, yeah, we really had loads of our members really took that on board and, and that became quite a big thing uh, within our community. That's also, I keep on going, I promise you that it, the data behind that is huge. Like it's, you know, you look at so, and you know, everyone thinks it's a fun test and like, oh, I can't walk that fast, but you can, I promise you, if you practice it, you can. And you just get back, but it's such an important thing because it's a huge contributing factor for, for mortality rates, the older you get. Look at the older people get, the slower they walk. And the idea is just keep moving, get, keep your legs turning over as fast as they possibly, like speedy Gonzalez style, like you get your feet going as fast as you possibly can um, and work on it. But yeah, no, I, I, we, we, it's one of the most frequently asked questions we get as well. Like, I can't walk 1.5 miles. I've tried it. It's impossible. It's not impossible. I promise you we have people in their late 50s doing it and early 60s. It's what any, anyone can do it. And I you, think watch anyone, one... you watch anyone walking around the streets of London, they can do it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. They're constantly on the, like, 
right, I've got to get there and I've got to get there now. They're probably stressed as well. But yeah. most of them can do it. They can do it. Anyone can do it. And I think well, you've met well, me, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I think as well, James, for, from this one, I really love that uh, 180. Uh, sorry, not 180. Your your height. I wrote down 180 because I'm about 180. I think. Really? But yeah, your height uh, minus um, was it minus your minus 100 for men, for men. minus 110 for women. Yeah, should give you an approximate idea of your weight in kilos. Yeah, yeah, and it works for you. Yeah. And, and, and James, I know you're into boxing, so like take Floyd Floyd Mayweather. He's yeah. 173. He boxed at 68 kilos. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, Conor McGregor, 175. Uh, his his weight cut was 70, 70, 69 to 70. That was you know little little things like that. You know, just example from from MMA. But you look at tennis. You look at all the all the stars there. Cyclists. Some of the cyclists. If you've got track cyclists, you've got the massive quads like quadzillas. Yeah. Don't count them because it's a sport specific thing. But you look at Lance Armstrong. Um, can we mention Lance Armstrong because he's a drug? Yeah. No. <laughs> but you know, and I mean, you know, all is these... he not like a couple of a couple of um, not kilograms? But what would you call a couple of grams lighter? Because like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's. I mean, I know that that people listening to this will be doing that and working that out for themselves. So that's another. That's a great take home. But also, so just just to, just to touch on that thing as well, for a lot of people out there who are going to listen to this and they're going to realise they don't fit nowhere near that number, one or two things will happen. One, they'll go, holy shit, I'm really overweight, I need to do something about it, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. And then the other thing will be, that's bullshit, that's not true, all right? Please take data greater than feelings, <laughs> you know, like, like it's, it's really important, like just, just sit about it and think about it. A little bit, and it's a good way to do it. So, like, I I appreciate there's two two ways people will take that. They're like, oh no, nah, don't like it. But when you look at things around, particularly when it comes to athletes and sports and being healthy, it's a good way to look at it. No, I love it. Um, Pete, do you have anything to say or any questions or anything for for James while we while we wrap up? I, I've I've got loads of stuff. I've written loads of stuff down. <laughs> but like, you know, you could go on forever about this. But the big thing, mo like, so people use. The thing about when people want to lose weight is they don't know where they should be. Nobody knows where they should be. And people will be like, BMI isn't a great example. So that, what James just said, that, that um, height minus 100 is, is really good because that gives you a benchmark of where you should, where, where you should be, but where, like, where's a healthy... A, ball, a kind of a ballpark range. It's, it's, it's a 10 kilo buffer as well. Like, I'm not like... Saying... But I love it because there isn't, there isn't actually anywhere that says what weight should you be. People have an idea of what weight they should be, but it's just arbitrary, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then the other thing was the, the counting calories. Um, all these calculators that are out there, you can do it online and all that. But people tend to overestimate how active they are. Yeah. Or yeah. underestimate how active they are and have too too few calories, like, which is probably what, what women do. And blokes probably and estimate that they're doing that they're some sort of athlete and doing loads of exercise because they, they walk to the car in the morning. But the trial and error thing on that, I think, is brilliant because it's like, start for, like how many calories are you eating now? Just track it. Don't even change anything. How many are you eating now? Honestly, it's, it's crazy. Are, like you, it's... are you putting weight on? It's too many. How fast are you putting weight on? Knock a few off. Are you yeah. still putting weight on? Knock a few off. It might take you a month to work it out, but then at least you know. But that's the most important thing. That you said it, it's a month. It takes four yeah. weeks minimum. To do it because that you're getting a good insight into people's daily lives and for people out there who really want to know how we calculate it we use the muller equation we find the muller equation is the best um way we guess work as in do things how many fruit corners you eat yeah <laughs> yeah you eat, yeah fruit corners yeah that's great i like a slow corner we use the muller equation and then they have the different <laughs> Doesn't Muller equation mean something different in Newcastle? Hey, probably. Hey. And then we have, then from the activity level on that, we start, most people, everyday people over 30, they are starting on light activity, right? Not moderate, where people think you should start off with, light activity. You have sedentary, light active, moderate, very active, and extreme activity, right? Um, as an idea, like me, I am I am training the gym five days a week, six days a week. I'm playing cricket four to seven times a week, right? I'm cycling in and around Cardiff all the time. My steps are over fifteen thousand. I'm at moderate activity. 
For whatever reason, that is my that is my baseline maintenance level, right? It should theoretically be extreme, but it's not. It's by trial and error, knowing it's moderate, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, some people will differ, but we always start off at light activity because that's where you find a good proportion of people are at, um, to be right. And just to give, again, to give people ideas and numbers, so my, my maintenance calorie level, right, is 2,650 calories. That's my maintenance level, right, for what I'm doing most times. Um, if I want to go into a deficit, I go down to 2,050, right? That's, that's just the, that's the difference I work with to give some ideas. But, but yeah, ma maintenance for a month is the most important thing I can share with people here. And look at it the long term. Don't think about your 30 day cleanse, 30 day maintenance, what, how much are you eating over the course of a month? Uh, and Mr. Paul Bassett, do you have uh, any questions or any, uh, any final thoughts? It's surprising how much you need to eat really. Cause I mean, I was working with, um, with Chris Lowe. We had him on as a guest, I think probably a couple of episodes after you, James. And uh, my maintenance, no, my weight loss calories were 3,200. Uh, and my maintenance was about 3,600, 700. And I did, I mean, I lost probably about just under half a kilo a week for, you know, maybe two months on, on that 3,200. Um, and it's surprising how much you need to eat if you are very active. Um, but now it's, it's much less because I'm, I'm not quite as active at the moment. But it, I, I, like you, I always think that people should start on that, err on the side of light light activity because we can certainly think oh i burnt 700 calories in this workout today i, I doubt that's the case um but uh you know i've done that that 1.5 mile thing it, it's great a lot of my clients did it i thought it would be e not easy i thought because i did so much kind of cardio and i was like oh, yeah i'll do it and i got halfway through and i thought i'm going a bit slow here i need to pick up the pace a bit and then there's that panic as i got closer and closer to 20 minutes that i wasn't going to be able to post the time and then I realized I was walking uphill as well. So it actually killed me near the end. <laughs> but it was, a, <laughs> it was a, good, a good test. And I had a lot of clients do it. And they, and they I say they enjoyed it, but they, they certainly felt a sense of achievement, the ones that have got it. You know? Well, if, if you want to go to the next test, um, <laughs> if, next, if yeah. next level, it's three miles in, uh, in an hour. Oh, three miles? It's oh four. Yeah, yeah. No, it's four miles an hour because you, you got double. It's four miles in an hour. Sorry, my bad. So you want to get 60 minutes, it's four miles. Um, once you can do four miles in an hour, you can then start adding 5% of your body weight. So ideally, if you want to go up the levels, again, it's different levels all the way up for people who want to get to here. So you, you hit your first goal, 1.5 miles in 20 minutes. Next goal is four miles in an hour. Then when people are four miles, you can add 5% of your body weight and keep going until you can get to about 20% body weight. And I promise you, if you put somebody with 20% body weight on, do four miles an hour, they are a machine. <laughs> yeah. If... Also, I can, I can attest for this because I did a 100-mile walk a couple of weeks ago and it was awful. <laughs> I don't recommend it. However, if you want to lose two, uh, two kilos, do that. I lost two kilos in like a day and a half. <laughs> yeah. And I lost the will to live as well. But anyway. <laughs> you be count, would that count as light or high activity? <laughs> <laughs> it. But no, guys, thanks so much for having me on. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so, James, if people want to find out more about you, want to find out about Strength Matters, want to kind of, you know, uh, you know, follow what you're doing, uh, keep up to date with all your latest thinking and your latest, uh, you know, protocols and, and, and output and content and things, what's the best uh, way for them to do that? Cool. Very simply, uh, if they follow me um, and see all me playing cricket, snowboarding, running mountains, sort of stuff, at James Breeze on Instagram, that's the easiest way. Strength Matters, at Strength Matters, if you want to see what we're doing as a company uh, and see all the stuff here. But I keep saying to people, if you honestly want to see our exact thinkings now, like I've literally put it all into the magazine. Like it's, you know, this is the running magazine, for example. You know, every protocol that we do is all the in-depth stuff. That's why I spent most of my time writing and publishing in there. So if they want to get to more, know more about that, um, just go to Strength Matters, I think, free magazines or like on the website. Uh, I think it costs like a couple of pounds and I'll ship you three magazines for free just to have a read and have a look. So have a look and at I that. I get the magazines every, every month. They're fantastic. And I'm, I'm due for, a, I am a bit behind reading them though, but I've got a holiday in a few weeks and I usually kind of pack them and take them away when on holiday when I know I'm going to have some good reading time and, and, uh, and sit down and read them. So no, that's great. So um, yeah, thanks so much, James, for coming back on again. Uh, we will be back uh, next week where we have Val Craft back on 
and uh, and Diane Udale, who was Jet from Gladiators back in the nineties. I saw that. I saw that. Like, how how did you get Jet back on? She she was she was the one I I, I so fancied her back in the day. She was my one. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be a bit weird next week. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. So uh, so yeah. Val and uh, and Diane will be on with us next week. Uh, we've got some great guests. We've got uh, Stu McGill coming on for, from uh, Dr. Stu McGill from up in Canada um, coming on. We're going to have, hopefully, uh, we'll get some other good, great guests on leading up to our one-year birthday. Um, but please do make sure that you like, subscribe, follow, share. If, you, if you're if you watching or listening on a platform that allows you to leave reviews, please leave a review for us. And remember the, uh, the, the, the Health Oddity Facebook group which you can find if you just search the group or there'll be a link in the show notes here somewhere. Click on that and, uh, and join us in the Facebook group to join the conversation uh, and we can, we can converse with you in there. So thanks very much to, uh, to uh, Mr. Peter Lance. Say goodbye, Peter. Ta-ra. Thanks for listening. We appreciate you all. Say goodbye, Mr. Paul Bassett. Goodbye. <laughs> and uh, say goodbye, Mr. James Brees. Cheers, guys. Thanks so much. Lovely. Thank you, guys. We'll see you all next week. Take care. You've been listening to Health Odyssey with Peter Land, Paul Bassett, and James St. Pierre. To get your regular fix of hype-free health, you can subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your favorite podcasts. You can find out more on today's and other topics at healthodyssey.com or find us on Facebook or Instagram by searching for Health Odyssey. Health Odyssey.